targeted health improvement program, CAFIP Health Hour. The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women's health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session, we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. Good morning. Welcome to our regular Health Hour. Um, nice to see all of you today. Uh, today's a, a, a great, a really good day. Um, and my name is Ngozi Ediosage. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a neonatologist, which is a, a branch of paediatrics, and I work in Manchester. Um, it's been a great week, hasn't it? Um, we've had the Windrush celebrations, and I'm hoping that many of you will join us in the park after this morning's uh, talk. I'm delighted to invite um, Dr. Michael Sapong, who is a dentist, because whilst we've concentrated on lots of things in the body, we shouldn't forget our oral health, because as you will hear from him, that good oral hygiene um, and also problems with, um, it, with your teeth and, and things in your mouth can be a harbinger of other um, serious problems and other underlying problems. So it's one area that we shouldn't forget. So as usual, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sapong and if you have questions, please put them in the chat, put your hand up. This session is for you. Um, and without further ado, I'll just hand over. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Good morning, everybody. And um, welcome to uh, this morning's health talk. I think the first time I, I presented a talk was last week. And I hope that everybody uh, managed to take something away from this. Today, we're going to be talking about good oral care. And um, this is a, a title that was handed to me from Khan, and I'm going to do my best to uh, do justice to it. Um, a bit about me. So um, I'm a dentist based in Manchester. I've spent about 25 years working in, in NHS dental services. I owned and managed a dental practice for about well, 17 years to uh, 2001. At the moment, I am very much into anxiety management. I provide a referral service with uh, sedation for minor oral surgery. Um, and that's where I am at the moment. So that's my phone number and that's my email address. Please feel welcome to uh, contact me if you have any issues that you would like to discuss. Unfortunately, at the moment, I do not have a patient list of my own, so I'm not accepting patients at the moment, but uh, that might soon change in the near future. Right, so today, what shall we talk about? We're going to talk about oral hygiene and specifically poor oral hygiene, because oral hygiene itself, when it's going well, means that there are no problems and um, everything is hunky-dory. Um, of course, we'll talk about how to maintain good oral hygiene when you've got it, but most of the talk will focus on poor oral hygiene or defective oral hygiene. We use our teeth and our mouths for a lot, so it's not surprising how many things can go wrong over time, especially if you don't take proper care of your teeth. 
Most dental and oral problems can be prevented with proper oral hygiene, and most people will likely experience at least one dental problem uh, during their lifetime. We will also talk about the common types of oral disease that uh, can, can occur. Oral disease, diseases of the mouth and the jaws, uh, well, the list is as long as your arm, but we'll just focus on some of the common ones. Again, we'll talk about the risk factors for these diseases. We'll, we'll talk about um, what predisposes you to a greater risk of uh, getting these conditions. And finally, we'll talk about prevention. We'll talk about how to prevent um, uh, oral diseases, how to prevent poor oral hygiene, and how to maintain good oral care. Right. Now, as dentists, we are interested in you as a patient. Uh, um, physically, we're interested in your face. Um, so we're interested in your face from um, your eyes and downwards and from your ears and forwards and all the way down to your uh, clavicles, your um, uh, collarbones. Now, once we've looked at that, we zone in on the mouth. So we enter the mouth and then we're interested in your lips, your cheeks, your gums, uh, the floor of your mouth, the palate, and the oropharynx. The oropharynx is the area where the mouth sort of meets the, meets the throat. Um, at that stage, we hand over to the ENT people. Um, the, our area of interest is mainly, well, if you look at it from a point of view of um, um, space and, and, and geography, it's mainly soft tissue, but there are some specialized structures in your mouth, which we need to talk a little bit about now so that uh, the rest of the, the talk can be understood and appreciated better. And I'm referring specifically to the tooth. The tooth is the peg. Think about it as a, as a peg, which is sitting in your jawbone. Now, it sits partly in your jawbone and shows partly in your mouth. The bit that shows in your mouth is called the crown. The bit that sits in your jawbone is the root. The crown is covered on the outside by a hard impervious substance called enamel. It's actually the hardest substance in the body. And the enamel covers dentine. Dentine makes the bulk of the tooth uh, tissue. And dentine is still a hard substance, not as hard as enamel, but it's filled with a lot of nerves, uh, fluid, and it, it can be very, very sensitive. So the enamel covers and protects the dentine. In the jawbone, uh, the, the root part of it has still got the bulk of dentine, but this time on the outside, it's covered by something called cementum, dental cement. Dental cement is a bit harder than dentine, but not as hard as enamel. And it actually forms a very, very thin layer, thin coating over the roots of the tooth. Between the dental cement and the bone that, that actually holds the tooth in your jaw, there is what we call the periodontal ligament or the periodontal attachment. A periodontal attachment is a bit like Velcro and it serves to hold your tooth in your jaw. Damage to your periodontal attachment is what happens when you have um, periodontal disease, the dreaded periodontal disease, which we should talk about. Now, all of this structure houses in the center, so in the, in, the, in the middle of the dentine, is the pulp space. The pulp space is a space which contains blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics, and provides nourishment uh, to the tooth. So it's, it's quite a good idea that we appreciate this, because as we go along, there will be bits that come up where I have to refer back to the basic tooth structure. So let's get back to our main area of interest, poor oral hygiene. Now, like the man on, in, in the picture, there may be some who are just at their wits and tearing their hair out. He doesn't have hair, but tearing their hair out about the problems that they're having with their um, dental disease and so on and so forth. Um, there's, there's help at hand. So, 
poor oral hygiene, the effects of poor oral hygiene, it puts you at risk, increased risk of disease, puts you at increased risk of oral and dental disease. It also puts you at increased risk of other um, uh, systemic diseases. When you have gum disease, bacteria that forms in your mouth will enter your bloodstream and can cause illnesses. Poor oral hygiene also interferes with your overall health um, because the toxins that are produced by um, poor oral hygiene can enter your bloodstream and because your blood goes everywhere, then it's uh, just a, a short stretch to imagine how this can affect every single part of your body. Eventually, poor oral hygiene leads to tooth loss and tooth loss comes with all sorts of um, functional um, deficits and even more significant than that, psychological deficits. A lot of people who simply cannot live the life they want to live because they don't have the teeth that they want to have. There's also, and this is significant for quite a few of us, evidence of increased risk above the norm to cancer and dementia. I just mentioned cancer and, 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 and dementia because these are some of the common ones. But yes, there's published evidence of increased risk uh, to these um, conditions if your oral hygiene is not exactly right. Oral uh, hygiene and tooth loss can change your appearance. And like I said before, um, it can lead to all sorts of psychological and social problems. Children are the future. Teach them well and they will not go wrong. Teach them well and our, few, our, our collective futures will be bright. So I thought we stop here, just a short segue. and. Just a few points on children. Children are the responsibility of their parents um, up until a certain age. I think the, the um, child care professionals and the social, um, social care people who can give us a bit more uh, definition on that. But you need to give the early child a good diet and you need to give them instruction, well, training on how to adopt and maintain a good diet uh, for life. Um, fluoride, try and get fluoride into your child's uh, dental regimen because it's been established beyond doubt that fluoride is very important in the formation and the maintenance of healthy tooth structures. Toothbrushing, uh, plaque removal, children should be instructed and monitored in their toothbrushing so that they can achieve effective toothbrushing habits um, while they're still young. Now, it's interesting to note that tooth decay is still a big problem in England. Um, and tooth decay extractions under general anesthetic are the fourth common reason, the fourth, yes, fourth most common reason for um, admitting uh, children to hospital for, yeah, for general anesthetics. Okay, let's get back. <laughs> Poor oral hygiene. Um, what happens when you have poor oral hygiene and what are the, the signs and symptoms? Um, I just put up a list of a few things, but it's, it's a lot more than this. It can lead to ulcers and sores in your mouth. Uh, an important thing about ulcers and sores, if you have an ulcer which does not heal after two weeks with treatment, with or without treatment does not heal for two weeks, then you should always see a dentist because that's uh, one of the um, uh, uh, pointers for oral cancer. Poor oral hygiene will also lead to bleeding on brushing and bleeding on brushing is experienced by the majority of um, of adults who present to the dentist. It's perhaps the most common um, complaints that we get. Of course, it stands to reason you get uh, bad breath, chronic bad breath, sensitivity, um, and toothache. These 
two slightly different things, but sensitivity and toothache both result from tooth tissue loss um, coming from two separate perspectives. And loose teeth, receding gums, gum disease, all of that. So people normally complain about pain on eating, pain on biting, pain on chewing. People, patients will present uh, at the practice with swellings of the face, of the cheek. Um, poor oral hygiene, as, as much as it affects the salivary glands, can cause people to have a, a dry mouth and suddenly especially denture wearers find that their dentures are rubbing a lot more than they did before. And they wake up in the morning and their mouth is dry and all sorts. Clicking of the jaw. Um, a lot of us grind our teeth, especially at night. So that can be a problem. Um, some of us also have malocclusion. So teeth that do not actually meet properly, which means that when they go to function, eating, chewing, talking, and all of that, they're using far less than the full complement of their teeth. And because of that, they're putting a lot of pressure on the teeth that they're using and their jaws. Uh, cracked or broken teeth, yes, can result from sports, injuries, accidents, and um, excessive grinding of the, of the teeth of the jaws, sorry. Right, let's look at some of the uh, common uh, dental diseases in some detail. So the first one I put up here is um, dental decay. So caries, holes in your teeth. Now I've tried also in doing this to show with a picture, some of the excellent results that can be achieved if you see a good dentist and have the caries repaired. So dental caries results when plaque forms on the surface of a tooth. Okay, let's go back a little bit. In your mouth, you will, um, there's saliva, and there's lots of bacteria, fungi, viruses. Now, the bacteria, let's focus on bacteria for, 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 for the sake of um, this talk today. But the bacteria will feed on nutrients from the saliva and they'll produce a sticky substance called plaque. Now, plaque will, has the potential to stick onto anything and everything, but it will typically stick onto the gums and stick onto the teeth. The saliva functions basically to wash away the plaque. So in a good situation, you, you have saliva with low levels of bacteria producing a little bit of plaque, and this plaque is regularly washed away by a good flow of saliva. That's what you get in good, perfect oral hygiene. Now, dental caries results when the plaque forms on the surface of a tooth and stays there. It's not removed. Now, the plaque, if it's not removed, and the bacteria, um, if they are not um, challenged, will continue to form more plaque. In time, the plaque becomes acidic. And the acid and plaque will eat away at the enamel of your tooth. The enamel of your tooth will start to get broken down. It's in early stages quite reversible so that if you're brushing your teeth regularly, then um, whatever damage is produced to the enamel by plaque is uh, reversed when you when you brush your teeth and remove the plaque. But if the plaque is not removed, then the damage to the enamel progresses and it progresses through the enamel until it reaches the dentine. Because the dentine, like I said, is softer than the um, enamel, the decay progresses even quicker through the dentine and gets into the pulp chamber. The acid and the bacteria then attack the blood vessels the blood vessels and uh, lymph and nerve and all of that dies. And then you end up with an abscess and eventually the tooth has to be taken out. Now, all of this can be accompanied by a significant amount of pain at some at certain points of the process. Um, the other 
common uh, type of um, dental disease, uh, gum disease or periodontal disease, starts very much the same way. It's the same saliva and it's the same bacteria. This time, slightly different kinds of bacteria. So different kinds of bacteria act in dental decay from um, periodontal disease. But the plaque forms this time on the gums. It initiates an inflammatory response in the gums. The gums peel away from the tooth. And in time, the plaque also calcifies. So the plaque goes from soft to hard and it begins to propagate. It begins to grow down the side of the tooth towards the, um, the tip of the root. Now, at this stage, you will have calculus growing down the side of your root in an area where your toothbrush cannot reach. So if you do not see um, a hygienist, dentist, or therapist, you can be brushing as best as you can, but your periodontal disease will continue. Eventually, it gets to the tip of the root. Uh, you get an abscess. The tooth uh, gets loosened, and tooth loss results. Oral cancer. Oral cancer, again, is a, um, a disease of the soft tissues of the mouth, sometimes the hard tissues, but let's just stick with the soft tissues. And the predisposing factors to oral cancer, uh, poor oral health, um, uh, poor toothbrushing, poor oral care, uh, alcohol, tobacco. Um, in recent years, uh, there's a, a, a virus, human papilloma virus, which has been shown especially in young people, to contribute to the um, incidence of, uh, of oral cancer. And this is happening especially in Europe and North America. Oral cancer is more common in older people than in younger people, and it's more common in men than in women. Globally, it is number 13 in the uh, list of all cancers. But I think in this country, it's a bit further down. I couldn't give you the um, exact uh, position. Other uh, types of oral disease, trauma. So uh, teeth get broken. And this is, a, is usually a result of uh, sports injuries, accidents, um, bicycle um, uh, accidents and, and things like that, um, violence at, at home uh, well, or, or wherever um, as well. Now, I've just shown a picture of a very minor uh, tooth injury and the results that a good dentist can achieve for you um, in fixing it. But these injuries can be very, very extensive. Uh, think about a road traffic accident where somebody's teeth are all smashed. Um, and they can be very expensive to treat. Expen expensive both in terms of time, uh, cost, and uh, materials, and also very psychologically very expensive, um, time taken off work and, and all of that. In a lot of cases, there's associated tooth loss and the psychological impact um, post-injury can be quite severe, um, not to mention physical, um, yeah, not to mention functional impacts as well and quality of life issues. The other um, oral health um, disease that we, we find a lot of, this tends to be a, very much a lifestyle um, issue, is dental sensitivity. If you remember, I said to you that the hard enamel covers the dentine, which is soft and sensitive. You need a certain thickness of the enamel for it to be um, effective. As we all go through life, we find that our enamel gets thinned down through the mundane things that we do, um, eating, brushing our teeth, basically looking after our teeth, thins down the teeth. Um, and when that happens, when your enamel gets too thin, your teeth can become sensitive. Again, like I can mention before, gum disease. So with gum disease, the gums recede away from, from the tooth. 
uh, the root becomes exposed and the cementum that covers the root dentine, because it's softer than enamel, anytime you go to brush, you're brushing it down. In time you brush the, you remove the enamel and the dentine is exposed and it's sensitive. When you have cracks in your tooth, it can lead to sensitive teeth. And just like the, you need a certain thickness of the enamel to be effective, you need a certain thickness of uh, restorations, fillings as well. So when your fillings wear down, it can make the tooth underneath sensitive. It's important to um, bear in mind that treatment of sensitivity really takes time because you need to modify your habits, the habits that have produced the sensitivity over a period of time so that the tooth can recover. So it's not usually um, a one-stop issue. If you go to the dentist and you have your sensitivity treated um, and you find that it's gone by the time you're leaving the dentist, you will get it back if you do not modify the habits that have produced the sensitivity and quickly too. So that's just a, a, a quick tour through uh, some of the common oral diseases that we see in practice. Um, at this stage, there'll be people asking, why me? Why is it me who's getting all this, um, all these problems with my teeth and my mouth? And again, there's some good news. It's not always your fault. Um, there are um, family history uh, reasons, there's genetic reasons uh, why some people get more oral diseases than others. Sometimes you're taking medicines for, uh, and you're, you're doing the right thing, taking medicines for another condition, and that can have side effects on your intraoral tissues. For example, uh, a lot of epileptics who take certain medications find that their gums swell up and their gums bleed a lot when they brush their teeth. That's just one example. Um, oral health inequalities, and this is where I'm always proud of the work that Khan is doing. Uh, depending on where you live and your access to services, you find that you're more susceptible to um, oral health um, problems than other people who live in other places. The good news, though, is that no matter what the situation is for you, a lot of these risk factors are modifiable, and there are things that you can do um, to mitigate your experience of oral disease. Now, the main risk, risk factors, um, if you think about it, are poor toothbrushing habits. So as we established before, um, plaque forms a strong part of, of the reason why you're getting um, oral diseases. So if you're not removing your plaque regularly and efficiently, it will either lead to cavitation or to periodontal disease. Tobacco use. Um, tobacco uh, smoking. Smoking um, alters the oral environment and promotes the growth of certain bacteria, certain bad bacteria over others. It also alters the ability of your saliva to clean and wash your mouth. So over time, in addition to um, giving you a chronic bad breath, over time you find that it puts you at a disadvantage. Alcohol also has an effect. Eating an unhealthy diet, so a diet rich in sugar will encourage the um, formation of acid because the bacteria metabolize the sugar into acid and will encourage the formation of cavities and your increase your tooth decay experience. Um, you need or you want as much as possible to eat foods that have um, a lot more fiber in them. And some foods 
have actually been shown to clean the teeth as you eat them. So you want to look at that as well. Acid reflux and vomiting um, that will chemically wear down your um, enamel and dentine and predispose you to sensitivity and other oral uh, health diseases. Hormonal changes, especially in women, can also uh, be a risk factor. Now, prevention. How do we prevent oral health diseases? Now, the burden of oral diseases and other non-communicable diseases can be reduced through public health intervention by addressing uh, common risk factors. So promoting a well-balanced diet, low in free sugars and high in fruit and vegetables, and flavoring water as the uh, and flavoring water as um, the main drink. Um, a diet heavy in proteins and when it's heavy in proteins associated with other risk factors like smoking on al or alcohol has been shown to be um, dangerous to your general health and also um, dangerous to your oral health. Stop all forms of tobacco, including um, chewing of betel nuts and areca nuts and quit. Um, reduce alcohol consumption and as much as possible, use protective equipment when um, you engage in sports and um, riding bicycles and, and um, put your seat belt on when you're driving. All of this will reduce the risk of um, dental and facial injuries. I think fluoride also is an essential uh, factor in prevention of dental caries. It's, it's been proven beyond doubt that fluoride in your um, toothpaste, fluoride in your diet, um, fluoride in your mouthwash will help with reducing dental decay. I'm actually going through this as quickly as I can because I suspect that a lot more of the time will be taken up answering uh, questions that um, you guys will have. So we're coming to the end. Um, yeah, we've been quite quick today. I have a few tips. Um, uh, let me see. Yes. The bedrock of good oral hygiene is toothbrushing. So brush twice daily, brush using a fluoride or fluoridated toothpaste, and brush effectively. Um, you can brush as many times as you want. If you're not brushing effectively, you're not helping yourself. Your toothbrush will not remove all the plaque. So consider using interdental aids like flossing, um, interdental brushes. A lot of people use toothpicks to clean their teeth. You have to be very careful when you do that because you run a risk of damaging your gums when you go to use toothpicks. And especially again, when a lot of what people use are cocktail sticks, not toothpicks. So meticulous oral hygiene is very important. Also, if you can use a mouthwash, it tends to help. Make sure it's got fluoride in it. Ah, I just mentioned fluoride. Yes. Um, fluoride has been shown to um, replace some of the other ions when uh, teeth are being formed and to produce a stronger tooth than you would otherwise have gotten. So the, the, the core structure of the tooth itself is stronger and more resistant to decay. Now, even then, once the tooth has been formed, getting fluoride in contact with the outer surface of the tooth has also, be, has also been shown to be um, protective. Um, so fluoride toothpaste, I can't um, uh, emphasize that enough. In parts of Great Britain, where the water is fluoridated, we find that 
there's far less dental decay, especially in children, than in the parts where the water has not been fluoridated. I think there's been a, a big fluoride debate going on in this country for years. And the people who argue against fluoride, and perhaps rightly so, argue that uh, to put water fluoride in the water is mass medication, and that is against their fundamental human rights. Okay. Um, yeah. But fluoride, please, wherever you can find it. Um, sometimes, again, for adults who are at risk, oh, yes, um, for adults who are at um, greater risk of uh, dental decay, dentists are able to provide uh, fluoride toothpaste, which are uh, stronger than uh, sometimes two or three times as stronger in fluoride than your normal toothpaste, than the normal toothpaste you should get, um, you get from the shop. And speak to your dentist about this. The Public Health England um, encourages the application of fluoride varnish uh, to children's teeth in areas where um, the water is not fluoridated. Change your toothbrush regularly. Now, as much as your toothbrush is there to remove plaque and debris from your mouth, and bacteria, of course, in the plaque, it also, no matter what you do, collects some of this uh, bacteria and stores it over time. So if you keep a toothbrush for long enough, you get to a point where your toothbrush is now actually seeding your mouth with bacteria each time you brush, and you don't want that. So the recommendation for changing your toothbrush uh, is anything from uh, six weeks to three months, depending on who you ask or who you speak to. A more scientific um, uh, way of looking at it is to look at the splay of your toothbrushes. So when you buy a toothbrush, you will always, if you look at it carefully, you will always notice that the fibers are standing tall, the fibers are standing vertical. If after using a toothbrush for a period, you find that the splay is more than 15 degrees, um, then I think it's, it's time to change your toothbrush. Always go for a soft toothbrush. Uh, well, no, a toothbrush with soft bristles. As you go to brush your teeth, and if you remember, I said uh, about sensitivity, the toothbrush will also be wearing down your enamel um, little by little. So if you have a, a brush that is too hard, you're going to end up wearing down your tooth a lot quicker and giving yourself problems with sensitivity and other things like that. When you brush your teeth, it's always a good idea to pay some attention to the gums that sit around the teeth. Just make sure you tickle them a little bit. And also, it is not a bad idea to brush your tongue. Diet. <laughs> I think this is perhaps the, um, the, the biggest message, even, even, um, uh, even bigger than toothbrushing, that I would like you to take away. So diet, sugar is problematic. So for frequent exposure to sugar will result in dental decay. It's as simple as that. The more sugar, if you eat sugar all the time, and especially if you're not removing your plaque regularly with effective um, toothbrushing, you are going to get dental decay. And also, um, Apart, quite, no, okay. quite apart from sugar, it's also, I think I, I hesitate here because I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, but it's also recommended that you avoid acidifying foods, including um, heavy animal proteins in excess um, and replace those with alkalizing foods like dark leafy greens, uh, vegetables, and lean animal proteins, like so maybe chicken instead of beef. But I'm not a nutritionist, so don't, don't take this um, uh, to heart from me. It's just a recommendation. Also, vitamins. Um, 
vitamins A, D, E, vitamin K, vitamin C, um, zinc, uh, coenzyme Q10, all of this will help to make your um, oral health a lot better. In other words, the foods and vitamins that keep you healthy in every way can also keep your teeth and gums healthy. So, I think I'll stop here. Um, just a minute. We we set out. We set out to talk about oral hygiene and specifically uh, poor oral hygiene. Uh, we talked about the different types of oral disease. We've spoken about the risk factors for oral disease, and we've also spoken about prevention. Um, oh. Yes, and eventually, um, I think we've come very much to the end of uh, today's uh, today's talk. Now, it's, it's a shame that uh, Zoom uh, presentations are not in, as interactive as they could be, because I would be asking at the moment, how many people can recognize that woman um, on the right side of the picture? That's that's Yaz, um, a British British born uh, singer who in 1988 put out a song, The Only Way Is Up. So I would hope that after today's talk and for most of us and concerning our oral hygiene and oral, oral care, the only way is up. It's also interesting that Yaz is on the slide today because Yaz is a child of the Windrush generation. Thank you very much. And once again, I that's my name. That's my phone number and email address for anybody who would uh, like to contact me. Um, like I said, I do not have a clinic that actively takes on patients at the moment, but I'm always available to speak, advice, and direct. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such an interesting lecture. We've had lots of interaction and lots of questions in the chat. So I'm going to go through them. Please, if you're on the chat, keep um, your questions coming um, and we'll try and get through them in the time we've got. We've got about um, 20 minutes. Okay. Um, we've got a question here about fluoride and that they're mixed views. And I think you, you referred to this as well, And but you, you've said that there's incontrovertible evidence that fluoride is good. What about the um, things like charcoal toothpaste? Do they contain fluoride and are they any good? And, and as, as a, or fluoride toothpaste as opposed to any alternatives like clove, aloe, vera, neem, and charcoal? But a lot of those toothpastes, um, when you look at them, um, will also um, have fluoride incorporated. A lot of those toothpastes do different things from what fluoride does. Um, I think charcoal is um, to do with uh, whitening the teeth. And um, what's the other one? Aloe, I think is to Aloe do vera. with... Yes, I think it's to do with strengthening the connective tissues around the teeth. So aloe vera is looking more at the gums than at the teeth, I would have thought. So what you'd have think, what you're saying is that in, in essence, that all these things are good in addition to fluoride, but not to in addition to fluoride. Yes. Yeah. One thing you have to watch out for is the abrasiveness of your toothpaste or whatever you clean your teeth with. If you're cleaning your teeth with things that are too abrasive and charcoal can actually be quite abrasive then you can end up damaging your teeth more than you help yourself. Okay. Okay. So we'll go to the next one. One of the things you said, you said there are different sorts of foods. And I, once one sentence you said stuck out because I thought, well, I wonder what that is. And you said some foods clean your teeth as you eat them. Yes. And I thought, I want, I want the list of those foods. And I think somebody <laughs> in the chat wants it as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I can't give you an exhaustive list, but... Not exhaustive, but just examples of which sources. Yeah, I mean, things like um, uh, fruits, like apples, okay. things like celery. I, I, I think celery has been mentioned um, as, as, as uh, one of these things. But basically, you want to replace sticky foods with crunchy foods, if you can. 
Okay. Um, the other thing, you know, there's been a, a real rise in cosmetic de dentistry. You can't help notice that all our celebrities have perfectly formed white teeth. So what, what are your views on veneers? Veneers, I mean, fair enough. Veneers are aesthetic treatments. So you look at health and then you look at aesthetics. If you don't like the way your teeth look, then veneers are one of the options you have for changing the way that your teeth look. Veneers, actually, they are among the options that you have for you're changing the way your teeth look, they are not too bad because in the right hands, they do not involve, uh, well, in the right hands, they involve very little alteration or removal of your tooth tissue. Um, so yes, so that's veneers. But if you want to go down that route, then there's a whole list, or there's a whole range of things that you can do. The best, the best is short-term orthodontics which means that your teeth are not altered at all. They're not cut down, they're not added to, but they're just rearranged to produce a better appearance. Okay. Um, the debate of electric versus manual toothbrush, which is better? Well, it depends which dentist you're asking. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why there's a debate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is a debate. Um, to my mind, Nothing beats a manual toothbrush with a good technique. However, electric toothbrushes are always, always getting better. And also electric toothbrushes are, are getting so sophisticated that now they're doing a lot of the work for you. So nobody goes to brush their teeth and looks at the clock and say, I'm going to brush for two minutes but the electric toothbrush will do that for you. The electric toothbrush will tell you um, whether you've paid more attention to the left side of your face than to your right, for example. So it really depends on the needs of the individual. Um, actually, yeah, even, even I would like an electric toothbrush. So let's go electric, but get a good one. Okay. Yeah. So for those of us that don't have electric, well, I, I like electric because of the two minute thing. And it yeah. now tells you whether you're brushing too hard and things like that. So I, I'm an electric toothbrush fan. But for those of us that are here today, and there are quite a number of people that aren't, um, do you have a toothbrush with you? We're wondering whether you can have a little demo of, oh. <laughs> <laughs> of the best way to, is it, is it on the gum? Is it on the tooth? Is it? 90 degree, 45 degree. Okay. You want a toothbrush that has got soft bristles. Soft bristles. Yes. So if you go to the, 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 the sad thing is that toothbrush manufacturers do not standardize the, the hardness of their bristles. So somebody's soft bristle might be somebody's medium bristle and so on and so forth. But ideally get a soft bristle. Hold it against your tooth at about 45 degrees. So when you think about the tooth surface, you want it to be 45 degrees against the tooth surface and use a circular brushing motion, like you're scrubbing a floor rather than back and forth. Yeah. Not, not this, like this is better. Yes. Yes. And well, you, you, you need to angle it a little bit, but yes, there, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So, um, and also, like I said, when you brush, because the brush is soft, um, it's easier to um, apply to your gums as well, especially the gums just where they are attaching to the tooth. Okay. Now, the last time I was in at the dentist, they, they tried to get me to buy one of these water jet things. So yeah. I, I, they said it's very good, um, but I wasn't convinced. Was I wrong not to be convinced or is it a piece of kit that you think is essential or is becoming essential? Right. I think you've answered your question for yourself. It is a piece of kit that is becoming essential. In terms of cleaning between um, the teeth, cleaning the gums, it's, well, the interdental space, then it's about the best there is if you get a good one. 
all of these things depend on um, how well they are made and also how well you use them. But yes, the water jets are they're getting more and more sophisticated. Some of them will pulse. And also some of them will actually allow you to introduce mouthwash into that area. But is it, it using a water jet daily or brushing, doing all the recommended things, I'm going to see my hygienist every six months. Will, will that achieve a better balance? Because I just thought it was very fiddly to do the two minutes and then the water jet, it just sounded a bit, a bit much. I wasn't sure whether it was a sales gimmick or not. <laughs> that was, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, like I said yesterday, uh, well, not yesterday, last week, always remember that your dentist, in addition to providing you oral care, there's also an element of the whole show that means they're trying to sell something to you. Um, you want to have a comprehensive oral program for yourself. And the whole point of doing... The uh, whole point of doing this is so that you, you find a dentist, have a good relationship with the dentist, and work with the dentist together. So not everybody's going to need a water jet, for example. Um, not everybody's going to need um, uh, what can I think of? Um, but not everybody's going to need the same kind of toothpaste, for example. Um, your uh, recall intervals do not have to be six months. These days, they can be anything from three months to 24 months. But the essential thing, and please, 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 is that you find a dentist and you have a relationship with him or her and you work together. If you think that relationship is not working, work a little bit at it. But if it's still not working, you can always find another dentist. But that's that's the essential thing. Okay. We all know we need to brush our teeth twice a day. So once at night, that's really, that's um, quite obvious because you need to get rid of all the food that you've had the, during the day. Now, the morning one, do you do it just before when you wake up or have breakfast and then just after breakfast? Great question in the chat because I, I will have this debate. The now. science says that it doesn't really matter so long as you're removing, you're, you're cleaning your teeth at regular intervals. Um, and there are all sorts of, um, so the people who advocate that you brush your teeth after breakfast are saying that, well, um, when you eat your breakfast, you're going to get residue on your teeth and you're going to um, remove, um, remove the residue so you have a, a, a better experience throughout the day. Um, some people will counter that argument and say that, well, also there's, if you're, doing the right things, there will always be saliva, which is washing through your mouth throughout the day. And the saliva will do almost the same job or perhaps even the, exactly the same job for you. The people who advocate brushing before you have your breakfast are arguing from a feel good uh, point of view. So they're saying, why do you want to have your breakfast when you go other uh, old food and old debris in your mouth. And you won't have old food and old debris because you've brushed it the night before. You have brushed it the night before. Yeah. So uh, yes, it's it's a whole it's it's a whole argument. It it doesn't it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. Okay, for the person who asked the question, you can tell your thirteen year old it doesn't really matter as long as it's brushing twice a day. Yeah. Um, another thing that uh, people have come across is when you brush your teeth. Um, not, not rinsing. So brush your teeth, um, spit out, but don't rinse out the fluoride. Yes, that's the, that's the current um, uh, NHS England oral health advice. So um, rinse, don't spit. Oh, spit, don't rinse, sorry. Yes, spit, don't rinse. Spit, don't rinse, yes. But for, when I was discussing with someone, they said it's almost as if you sort of... Um, wash your clothes, still have the soap on them and, and leave the, leave it like that. It just seems a bit. It, it seems, it, it's, yeah. yes, it seems a bit. And all of these things. So it's like um, uh, washing your dishes and not rinsing them yeah. and leave the soap on. Or like like we said before, for the toothbrushing before meals or after meals, it, it, it's, it's neither here nor there. But the current advice um, is spit don't rinse because what that means is that you leave some fluoride in contact with your teeth 
for a bit longer. Eventually, the saliva will wash it away. Um, but yes, that's the current advice. Well, that, I suppose, only works if you don't use mouthwash. <laughs> it's you dentists that come up with advice. <laughs> Think for rinse, but use mouthwash. <laughs> yes, well, the mouthwash is also supposed to contain fluoride. So, yeah. And uh, don't rinse unless you're using mouthwash. Oh, let's not complicate it. If I don't, with... it's, it's the dentists that complicate it, isn't it? It's not me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to our listeners and people who've joined in. We're just at least you remember this today. Remember the debate we had about this. So I uh, hope you take home some really good take home messages. Yeah. And it's all about contact with of fluoride with your teeth, isn't it? Contact of fluoride. That's, the, that's the important thing. Prolonged contact of fluoride. Prolonged contact. So as much as so, there's no point rinsing it out with water because you're you're getting rid of all the fluoride, isn't it? Um. Yes, but you see, all of this. It's it's all advice. Really, it's not an exact science. But if you if you want to um, um, go down the purely scientific route, yes, then there's no point rinsing out with water. Just uh, leave the um, leave the toothpaste there. Spit, don't rinse. The other thing that people suffer from quite a lot is tooth sensitivity. Yes. Um, are, are there, apart from using toothpaste that contain you, because you see them in the shops where they all say for sensitive teeth, uh, uh, is there anything else you can do? Well, you want to prevent the sensitivity in the first place. And preventing the sensitivity means brushing with a soft toothbrush. Preventing the sensitivity means brushing regularly and effectively, so that you do not get a plaque buildup that will result in um, uh, gum recession and all of that. You also, if you notice that something is giving you sensitivity and you can avoid it, then please do avoid it. Bearing in mind all of this, the same way as we all go gray and get wrinkly as we grow old, your teeth will tend to get sensitive as you grow older because over time you've brushed them down, brushed them down and the enamel has become thinner. So- um, Something to look forward to. Uh, yes, something to look forward <laughs> to, yes. But um, once you've seen the dentist, again, work with the dentist, there are things that dentists can do um, to mitigate um, sensitivity. Once the Cause of the, um, the 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 predisposing cause of a sensitivity has been identified, then the first thing to do is to reverse it. And if you do, then over time your tooth should and will recover towards normal. Okay. So what what is is a discussion you have with your dentist about yes. the reversal? Is it there's nothing that you can do at home to reverse this? See the dentist. Because yes. yes, because you don't want to you don't want to be self-diagnosing um, and, and getting it wrong. Okay, great. Um, someone's put in the chat about the, the use of um, the need for mouthwash. Mm -hmm. Is there a need for mouthwash, or is this not exposing one to cancer of the mouth? Oh there is a need for mouthwash. It's a relative need. Um, everybody would benefit from a mouthwash. Certainly, but not everybody definitely needs to um, use a mouthwash. It's a good thing. Um, cancer of the mouth, I'd, I'd beg to differ because these days, um, a good mouthwash will have all the ingredients reviewed um, against cancer of the mouth. Okay. Now, the other thing that people, even if they're not going to go for veneers, people are much more aware of wanting their teeth to look nice and use tooth whiteners. And there are various things that you can get. I see them in the shops all the time. Are, are these good? Do they predispose to sensitivity? If you want to make your teeth whiter, what, what are the things that you'd advise people to do? Is that, because you, you see them all the time, They come, sometimes they have trades. Um, are they, would you advocate people using these things? Okay, so um, it's a personal thing again, but, Cleaner teeth look whiter. 
So if you're concerned about the look of your teeth, get them clean, first of all. If you um, have stained teeth and that worries you, then, well, again, work with your dentist. I always say work with your dentist, but find out why your teeth are being stained. And then there are things you can do um, to work against that. If after all of this, you decide that you want to whiten your teeth, then you must always remember that what you're doing is applying a chemical to your teeth or to your tooth. And there will always be uh, reactions. There will always be a reaction from your tooth to the chemical that you've applied. For a lot of people and for a lot of the strengths of tooth whitening gel that you apply, the effect is negligible and reversible. But for some people, um, they will experience um, quite significant um, sensitivity from the application of, of um, tooth whitening gel. So it's, it's, it's an informed choice that you must make. And the, the color of your tooth is very much an individual, uh, an individual thing. Black people, we are quite fortunate because simply because our skin is black, whatever color of tooth you have in your mouth gives you a good contrast. And it's true. So it looks whiter than it is. It looks whiter than it would look on a white person. Oh, okay. Um, that's interesting. Um, but this doesn't pertain to, you know, they're just normal toothpaste that say whitening. Those will not give you extra sensitivity. Those are okay to use. This is different to the gels that people apply or should be cautious about using toothpaste that say whitening. It's, it's all a personal experience. The toothpaste that say whitening will have the whitening gel or the whitening ingredient in them to a much lower uh, concentration than your whitening gels. Um, so the toothpaste that say whitening are far less likely to give you uh, sensitivity problems than the gel. But having said that, you also um, have to think about where this toothpaste is coming from, because there are lot, lots of things um, available that have not been properly tested, even in this country. Um, and depending on which shop you go to or who, whoever is selling it to you or where it has come from, it may or may not have been properly evaluated. So the onus is on, is on the user to check things out properly. Okay. Um, one of the concerning things you said was about the fluoride not being available across the UK and that you yes. see that people see that there are higher rates of um, poor oral hygiene areas that don't, doesn't have it. I know as I'm a pediatrician that there's a real problem with child dental health. So how would, how would I know if there's someone here that's thinking, you know what, I would prefer my child to have extra fluoride, but they don't know, how, do you, how can you find out whether the area you're living in has fluorinated water or not? Oh, the, the internet will tell you that. Okay. And, and there are maps on the internet. And um, Manchester is not fluoridated. I think Birmingham is, but Manchester is not. If you want your child to have fluoride, which is always a good idea, it's a toothpaste. It's a toothpaste, regular brushing, and also uh, see the dentist regularly because when you go to a dentist, the dentist applies a fluoride varnish um, to the child's tooth, which if left for uh, 30 minutes to one hour, gives the whole fluoridation thing a boost. To, uh, to the child's tooth. Okay, that's that's really helpful that. That's um, not great because I, I see poor, really poor dental hygiene in some of the children that I come across. Yeah. But the other thing I can't not address because there'll be people here with children is the use of bottles when children have teeth with sweet liquids in them, please. Ooh. Yes, that's, yeah. that's, that's an, a whole different area and perhaps you 
I can I can devote some time to that at another time, but perhaps you want um, a child dental um, health expert, and maybe I could find somebody for us um, at some point. But yes, you don't want your child to go to bed with a bottle in the mouth, because what when you do that, all you're doing, see, even um, ordinary milk contains sugar. So a child goes to sleep with a pool of milk around their teeth. Basically, you're applying sugar to the child's tooth for all the time that they're asleep. And if we go back to what we said about how dental decay arises, then that's where you are. Um, lots of um, parents of young children as well find it difficult to brush the children's teeth simply because the children resist. And so sometimes they won't do that. You have to find a way. Um, sometimes the parents themselves have... Um, there are all sorts of social problems that mean that the children are not taken um, good care of. Um, in my practicing life, I've seen, oh, more than four or five occasions where at some point it looks like the child um, care services are getting very, very serious on things like this. And um, parents are now are, are getting to the point where they uh, risk prosecution, but all of these initiatives after a while, they seem to fizzle out and then everything goes away. But I think the day is coming where the scrutiny and oversight on child dental health will mean that patients, are, uh, parents are held culpable if the child's dental health is not uh, at a certain standard and there are no good reasons for it. Okay. I suppose that's only if we've made every attempt to give them the information and support yeah. parents, because even with parents that, with children I see, not some of them I'll say to them, you know, you shouldn't have Coke in a bottle. Uh, you have a young mom, she, she doesn't know that, she just thinks it's easier for them to have it because she's yeah. never been told. Yeah. So I think we've come to our final comments for a question. Um, and this is about natural um, herbs or natural products that you can use to have healthy teeth and gums. So they've given an example, and I don't know whether this is their, their experience. So they've said cloves, and they've also said that if you have toothache, you can use salt as a toothpaste. Now, I'm reluctant to have this as our last word because I always think, so after this, I want you to just round up about the two take home messages. But obviously when we have people on the platform, I like to make sure that they're views and questions are aired because I think it's important this platform is for them but I just want you to comment on salt as a toothpaste um clove as something for healthy teeth and gums and um I think they were giving opinions on what can um what can dis discolor your teeth and quite rightly they've said tea and chocolate some chocolate biscuits but what they were asking what what are natural tooth whitening products and natural, other natural remedies you can recommend. I always find this bit quite difficult because obviously I'm a scientist. So I don't know, I don't have a lot of experience on natural products, but maybe as dentists, you're slightly different, but go ahead. I think, I think my, um, my experience and my inclination is very similar to yours. Um, there are lots and lots of um, accounts of, yeah, some people talk about um, salt and salt water. The, the one that seems to have had a bit of work done on it, and I looked at it a little bit while I was preparing for this, but I thought I wouldn't mention it because I couldn't be uh, authoritative about it, was baking soda. So um, baking soda, apparently, again, some, some uh, authorities claim that baking soda once a week um, helps with your teeth and your gums. but my um, uh, advice on this is that these things have been around for quite a while. And if you can find a toothpaste somewhere that has had um, this ingredient incorporated in it, then maybe you're on the right track. But if you find something that has not had any form of um, uh, scientific scrutiny, then maybe you should avoid it. So 
you can buy baking soda toothpaste from the shelves. Um, I think you can buy toothpaste that have got um, oil of cloves incorporated in them. Certainly charcoal toothpaste are also available. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, someone's just said that they've found out that their area isn't fluoridated, fluorinated. Um, and that's how they can make their water fluorinated. I think that's a government thing. It's about how you can react to having no fluoride in your water, isn't it? Yeah, it's a it's it, it's a government thing, and the politicians have been arguing it's uh, back and forth for ages. Basically, some politicians and with a very strong voice are saying that it's mass medication, and we can't have that. But other areas already have it. Yes, I think it's. I I'm not um, too hot on the details, but I I I don't know. I think there's a there's a whole historical thing to it. And, some areas where some areas have naturally fluoridated water. Uh, some areas were fluoridating before the whole argument came up. But yes, the at the end of the day, in 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 England, some areas are fluoridated, some areas are not. And the areas that are fluoridated have much much better um, child dental health statistics. Thank you. I don't know what more evidence our politicians need, but you know. I will leave, I, will, I, won't, I won't um stray into that territory because there's a lot going on at the moment. But Michael, thank you so much. That was You're really welcome. interesting. Um, from the comments and the questions, you can see that everybody was interactive and enjoyed your session. So thank you for coming. And thank you for those of you that were um, have joined the session. I'd just like to say what's really important for us is if you give us some feedback, there is a, um, there's a feedback um, poll. There's, to for you to answer that would be really great if you can because it's based on your feedback that we uh, are able to continue these sessions um it gives you an opportunity also to ask what you'd like to list them um, to hear here because as i said these sessions are for you and i can also just invite all of you who are in manchester to make your way to alexandra park for our um, winter oh, yeah. celebrations so i'm going to hand over to the Khan team now but thank you so much for joining us and it's been a pleasure Thank you, Michael. Good morning, and thank you all for joining us today. It is as always a pleasure to have our community joining us in numbers uh, in a Saturday morning to improve their health literacy, to share you know, uh, their personal experiences, and understand how to navigate the health system better. So it was a very insightful discussion. It was nice to hear uh, Dr. Michael's own opinion about <laughs> what he would do for himself regarding toothbrush, electrical toothbrush. It was nice to hear that he's been uh, converted now. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to thank him for sharing his knowledge with us today. And uh, we hope to see him many more times as always to our uh, host, a long time host, Dr. Ngozi as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so uh, I wanted just to share my screen with you and to talk a little bit about um, the our upcoming uh, um, events and what's on with CAN. So we do have Health Hour as always every Saturday at 11 a.m. Uh, so next week it will not be an exchange uh, um, any different from any other week. As you know, we have a big event of Windrush 75 at Alexander Park and still we are here because there is a big commitment that we have to our community regarding Health Hour. So uh, next, I also wanted to talk to you about Healthy Hearts. So it happens every Tuesday. Uh, it's towards the evening, so we can accommodate uh, everyone's schedule uh, at 6 p.m. And we talk about diet, exercise. Uh, we have Dr. Hiba as our facilitator. The guest this week is uh, Mariam, a, a lecturer in nutrition. And we have our physical instructor, or Orlando, as well. We'll be speaking about food fraud and um, what is food fraud and what is the best way that we can be smart about our choices when we make purchases 
um, understanding better, um, you know, what we buy and what we include in our diet. So um, as you know, kind of as many advocacy, well, many services, one of them being uh, advocacy, it is a free service where you can get advice on housing, immigration, education, a series of issues that might be affecting your day-to-day -day life. Again, it's a free service. The phone number of our helpline is on the screen, 0771002382. And our email for advocacy at can.org.uk is there as well. Uh, do reach out. We have all of this information in our socials as well. Uh, and there are most from our advocacy services and our advocacy uh, and empowerment team. Uh, we do have a drop-in session this week on criminal law. So uh, it takes place uh, online via Zoom, like the session, and it starts at six, about an hour, and you can get help on a series of criminal law issues as, as the name describes it. And you also have the opportunity to put your questions forward. So don't lose this great opportunities to access free services. Uh, can uh, at the moment is running a cost of living survey. We really want to know how the cost of living is affecting us, uh, us meaning our community. So um, please do reach out our research team. The QR code is on the screen again and our socials as well. This QR code and um, the links to access the survey are online. Um, this data is very important because uh, when we collect data, we can prove uh, that is issues that need to, need to be tackled. So um, yeah, uh, share with us your opinions. The, the, the survey doesn't take long to do, it's only a few minutes, about five minutes. Um, again, Windrush 75 today at Alexander Park. I hope to see you all there. It's a big party. The weather is great and we really want to be celebrating Caribbean heritage, culture and all their great contributions to British society. So please come and join us. Uh, we are at Alexander Park in Manchester once more. And now um, I wanted to just thank uh, in particular to our um, partners because Khan doesn't do these things alone. We have long running partnerships with Enfield Caribbean Association. Uh, their contact is on the screen. Um, the contact is for Dion John. Um, reach out if you need any information from them. They also are pretty active on social media. Uh, the same thing for Rafa International Development Agency. Um, another partner of ours uh, do reach out. Their contact is on screen uh, if you need any support from them or if you want to collaborate. We also uh, have Royal Assembly Redeemed Christian Church of God. Um, the contact on the screen is for Dr. Samuel Ocarenta. His phone is on the screen. Uh, another partner of us. When we share contact regarding partners, if you ever don't, are not able to take note, you can always email us, I put an email on uh, the chat and you can ask for their details via uh, that in that way. And this applies to all of them. Uh, Croydon BME Forum, uh, email as well on the screen, as well as a telephone, um, uh, always engaging a lot with us online and also on the chat box, various questions. Uh, so they are very welcoming to any questions that you might have so do reach out and uh last but not least uh bhi uh black health initiative um again very active on the socials you have their website on the screen and also their email address and phone number uh, i know uh, just like can they they really are interested in improving health literacy uh, around our community so please do reach out if you have any questions and yes thank you for joining us today on this saturday and I will see you later in Alexandra Park. And after that, next week on the next Hour Power. Thank you. Welcome to our Caribbean and African Targeted Health Improvement Program, CAFIP Health Hour.
The Caribbean and African Health Network, CAN, along with its national partners, are incredibly pleased to continue to bring to you targeted health and well-being education delivered by Caribbean and African doctors. These health hours are all about empowering, educating and giving space to black people so our communities can look after themselves better. Every Saturday, our black GPs or consultants present on those health and well-being topics that affect you, your family members and friends. Some weeks will vary and will include other panel members such as pharmacists, specialist nurses and faith leaders. Our health hours cover a range of topics and include mental health, heart health, women health, reproductive and sexual health issues, men's health, respiratory problems, cancer, sickle cell and many more. We have not forgotten to include within our health hours the many societal, cultural, religious and racial challenges that can go hand in hand with health problems and influence how we should respond to meet health and well-being needs. The sessions are designed for you and we want you to use the time to listen, learn, share your experiences and ask questions to our black doctors. During every session we will gather your feedback so we can continue to respond to the needs of our black community. To request any particular topic, please email health at khan.org.uk. We encourage you to invite others to our Health Hour sessions. Spread the word in our community. CATHIP is funded by the National Lottery Community Fund.